because that uh, to rebel, that people have a right to rebel, to justify that when there is oppression, people have a right to rebel. And so, you know, I think back to my father when he was 60 years old. The FBI started to compile files on him. Why? Because he led a group of youth who were being discriminated against on a work site. And he led them in a strike. And as a result of that, at 60, the FBI began to collect information on him. And what I want to say now is, the panelists discussed some of the organizing that took place in the 60s. And as a result of the organizing, the COINTEL program was actually developed. Many of these men who are sitting up there on the panel, they're modest, they're very modest, but because of their revolutionary activity, the COINTEL program was developed as a reactionary force. Anytime we organize as a people against oppression, against, against exploitation, the reactionary forces always respond. And that's what the COINTEL program was about. Right. And every one of these brothers who are sitting up there on that panel have had some personal experiences that they can tell you about. And I know many of you who are here because you know some of the history. You know about how they systematically went and murdered many of the leaders. They targeted black leadership with the ones that they were not able to kill. They tried to jail. And so they tried, they did everything they could systematically to destroy the movement. And that's going to continue, even to this day. Disinformation is another big issue where they would always put out disinformation. Lies, untruths, to scare folk, and keep people from being involved in organizing. And understanding that whole history is very important because as the young people today are justified in rebelling against the police brutality. Right. They're justified in rebelling against exploitation. They're justified in rebelling against poison water. They're justified in rebelling against people who are supposed to be elected officials, get taxpayer money for not doing the job. They're justified in rebelling. And they need to know, though, Anytime revolutionary forces organize counter-revolutionary forces wage an attack. And I think that's an important point that we don't want to forget. And I would appreciate if the panel members would discuss just a little bit about uh, the people that you know, the situation that you know where that has occurred in our history. Thank you. Let me, let me say, one, one, one of the, the ways that the, uh, well, it's not like to talk about these, a little bit of these things now, because it's we all 70 years old. Uh, one of the, I think the statute of limitations. I'll, I'll try to get there with you. Statute of limitations, rather. One of the ways that you can deal with a society that, that proclaims to be open and democratic is when you organize, organize, in fact, a part of your group that, in fact, conducts itself openly, and, you know, so you can talk to people without, without fear. Uh, the part of the success we had in, in Chicago was that we, we had open groups. Uh, the strategy was you participate in what the struggles of the masses of people were, but you maintain your independent organization. I mean, I'll watch for anybody reads Lenin anymore, but if you want to know what's going on, read Lenin in two tactics. That way you know that Bernie Sanders is not going to vote socialism. You know, 
you're supposed to organize your independent party, and then you can go into another party and try to move it. But don't throw your own organization away. I mean, that's just dumb. You know, so I'm in the Revolutionary Action Movement, but if there's a mass movement like there was in Chicago where people were getting arrested around the schools, I went there, and so I could talk to them while I'm in jail with them. So they'll listen to me. I'm not sitting on the side there criticizing them. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? No, no, I'm sitting next to them in a the jail cell, and I say to my brother, you know, how come we're locked up and we're right, you know? And so they think about that. Or if you get a movement of people like, I went to King out in Gage Park. I didn't believe in getting brick stolen in me. But if there's a lot of black people going out into an area to confront white racism, I can't say, well, I don't confront white people because I just want to shoot at them. That's stupid. You said, no, no, if this is where the masses of your people are moving, you go in there and you engage with them on the issues that they care about, not what you think they ought to care about. Right? And if you do that, then they will listen to you. They will protect you. That's how I was protected. Right? Black policemen in Chicago, because we helped them organize against the white policemen, that's who protected me in jail. You know, first time I got locked up, it was a white cop, you know, came down and said, you know, we were, um, in fact, Bernie Sanders in the same cell, bless his heart. And we all, they called everybody niggas and nigger lovers and all this and that. And this black cop named Henry, who was a death sergeant, big dude, right, comes into the cell and said, did somebody say nigger? And we said, he did, he did, he did, right? And Henry said, I hear that word one more time, you have to deal with me, right? And I said, the rest of y'all shut up through your singing sounds like crap, right? But when I was walking home at night from jail, because the buses don't run in the hood past 10 o'clock, uh, it's the black policemen, they will roll up after the white policemen roll up on you. Because, you know, they run your name, they head over the network, and all of a sudden, here comes two black cops, and they'll say, where are you going? I said, I'm trying to go home. They said, okay, we'll give you a ride, you know, you know we got this. Right? If you don't engage with everybody, and you don't, you don't put people outside of the possibility of organizing them, then they will get you. Right? That's the mistake the Panthers made in talking about pigs. I said, you know, we had that argument with Fred and, and Robbie Washington. Don't call black police pigs. It's the black policemen that will keep the white policemen from killing you. You make that mistake, you're going to be on the other side and you have no protection at all. Because we, we didn't have the, the ability to protect ourselves at that level. Right? But a black policeman could tell you, like, don't go downtown today. Don't do this. Don't do that. It's black policemen that told us to leave Grand Park when the other policemen were coming in and beat the devil out of people. You know, we had plain clothes people with us. And they said, you got to go because we got to go following you. And they said, why? We're looking at this rally. He said, man, said clear the park. He said, anybody do it? He said, he said, you know, clear the park. Cops are rolling up, getting out of the buses, put the shields on and with the batons, taking the badges off so you can't identify them. And they said, we got to go, man. This didn't have plan. And so he's telling them, otherwise we'd been sitting there getting beat to death looking at somebody in the speech. But it's the black policeman that told us, they said, no, this is, they're not playing. This is not, they're not arresting nobody. They, they come here to hurt people. You know, and so we got our last car out of Lincoln Park, Zoo Park, and they're right behind us. And if you don't have those contacts, you, you're going you're gonna to get hurt. You're going to get hurt badly. Uh, you don't attack institutions that black people have faith in. So you don't go walk in somebody's church and use a whole lot of cussing and MF this and because the people ain't gonna follow you. Mm. You know, you want those kids in those churches to come to your meetings, right? So you ask the minister, can I address the Sunday school, the afternoon school, the summer camp or whatever, and tell them what the issues are, what are your concerns and so forth. And so you have to have that piece of your apparatus, you know, and of course you have to protect yourself, but that's, that's not a public thing, you know. But if you have that kind of protection when people come at that part, you got people that can protect the other part, you know. So I'm, I'm playing being a college student. You know, I go to radical meetings. The FBI asked me that. They showed me pictures of me at these meetings. I said, yes, I, I studied these things. You know, I'm writing on them. I said, you believe in academic freedom? So yeah, whoa, back up. You know, now this is BS. They know it's BS. But they know if they come at me that way, I got a whole bunch of faculty and all kind of people that will come defend me on those grounds. Right? That's why I could, I could have Mohammed running around with me as a fellow student, even though they think he's underground. Because people think underground is like down there somewhere. <laughs> so, underground is like a metaphor. It's not really, nobody dug a hole and went down in it. <laughs> and so people, people don't get that. They don't get that. You understand, it's a mechanism for how you protect people's identity while they're still alive and functioning. Right? And so if I got this cover, and it was pretty good because they didn't grab on it, you know, He's sitting right there, broad daylight, in my house, in Everson, Illinois, wearing a Northwestern sweatshirt, jogging, running up and down, like a college student. 
He doesn't look like he's underground, so nobody's looking at him like he's underground. He wasn't sneaking in the back way and wearing a black outfit and crawling through the house. No, no, he's wearing a sweatshirt. Right? We walked him out every day. We ate, we ate at cafeterias and stuff. You know, that's you have to have an organization that in fact can handle the complexity of life in a society that has democratic rights as well as a police apparatus. And you have to be able to deal with both of those. So you have to protect yourself from the police coming at you. But you also have to have a person to open cover. So when people come at you, say, no, no, those are nice kids. They do good stuff in the community. Huh? They had a wonderful rally. You know, they helped me when I got into trouble with the police, you know. Then you can function. And you in Detroit, you already know, but you know, General Baker was the best at that. You know, you, you know, if you don't know one of the best organizers, know, he was right here in Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, General organized Sunday school kids, you know, they were five years old and it was two of them, that would be a group by the time you finished talking to them. Because right? every, everybody was capable of organizing and moving. And he understood that better than I ever met. I mean, he was, you know, I wish I could be happy with him as he was. Uh, but that was his attitude. Jen never excluded anybody in terms of their capability of being brought to your side. You know, however slow it took. And that's what you got to have in your head. So, of course, you take on the power thing, but you also have to have the people thing. You know, mm -hmm. and of course, you got, if you don't bring the sisters along, you ain't got nothing, nothing, nothing. You know? don't have all of them, you know, all of them try to sit in the corner and talk about what they're going to do, because you ain't going to do nothing. Right, until you have a meeting where the sisters are saying, what are we going to do? And then, if they agree, then you will have a movement. Right? You know, Mary is laughing because she knows that's true. Right? No, no, don't get into that women three feet behind crap because everybody be going back. At that point, everybody's walking backwards. Right? You're not walking forward if you got to keep looking over your shoulder to make sure the women are behind you. No, they're going to be up here so you know where they are. Well, she's right here. I know where she is. Right with me. Not behind me over there somehow. That's stupid stuff. Then, no, that's kind of revolutionary crap. You know, you move everybody. You move everybody, and you have an open thing so they can't come at you. And you have, of course, you have a protective mechanism, which we're not going to talk about. You know, uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> you still got outstanding warrants, so we can't. <laughs> 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 uh, if, if he's not going to add something, I, I just have a memory. Uh, we went, uh, I was in an organization with Muhammad. I remember we would have these party congresses in Philadelphia. Right? That's when I first heard John speak. It was one of them, I think, in 1973. But whenever we would come back, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, the FBI would be all over us. But how we figured it out one time was uh, there was one brother who was supposed to be one of our leaders. and they were really following him. And so whenever he drove somewhere, it'd be like three cars on him, but he wasn't really paying attention. How we found out was the neighbors. The neighbors put a note in our box saying, brothers, the dogs are about to bite. <laughs> and then uh, somebody came by to visit us when we worked there, and they told them what was going on. But that's why I always tell people, just something simple. Know your neighbors. Yeah. You know, don't be alien from the people in, in your community. Uh, so, because if they felt hostile, they would say, hey, just let them handle that by themselves. I'm not going to take a risk. So, uh, you know, I think that's very important. Just to, uh, I think the relationships, and I think that's what you're saying with, um, with black cops, right? Mm -hmm. Not to say, you know, we got some black cops who's yeah. treacherous too. Yeah. But I'm um, but I know of situations in Mississippi where uh, there might have been people who became cops because of the, the movement made a demand for black cops. But they would be some of the people who would call and say, Hey, the, you know, Klan is about to do XYZ. And how they would know that is because white cops who were in there with them who might have respected them and told them what was going on. So the relationship piece is very important. You know, we can't alienate people. You know, uh, John said earlier that uh, this fight is about uh, love, it's about humanity. So people need to feel that from us, right? And that, that can overpower some of the negative ideology oftentimes too.
So I, I think that's that's one of the ways we defeat them. One, you, you, you work with as many people as you can. You know, Robert said that there were three kinds of people. The people who are with you, the people who are sitting on the fence, and then there are people who are against you. He said that your strategy should be to win those people who are sitting on the fence over to you. You don't push them over to your opposition. Right? And in many ways, if you win them over, they can split your opposition or win some of the opposition over. And so, um, those of us who became targeted, because you know, there were many good organizers in many cities, and we were hunted. Uh, but we had established a network from working with people on different issues. All right that those of us who, in general was hurt at one point. He could disappear from Detroit, right? and then come back. So if people in that other area hadn't developed those kind of relations, he couldn't let it happen. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> and likewise, I've been hunting every. Oh, uh, well, people met when they got to school. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the that school. You know, uh, they went all over Glenn and then Glenn got to Sweden. Why? Because we had a wonderful conference in Cincinnati where he was going to be the keynote speaker. Ha ha ha. Guess who was not the keynote speaker that day? Uh, but there was a whole lot of people buzzing around there waiting for the keynote speaker to show up so they could bust him. <laughs> hey, 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 we ain't that dumb. You know, with a whole lot of people in the bureaucracy with that deal, because they thought we got him now, he got to show up because it's on the poster. Right. Come on. Come on. I mean, first of all, you have to think, don't, don't ever give up your brain. That's the other thing. You know, don't, don't follow people that don't know any more than you know, and don't give up your brain. Right? If you think something doesn't make any sense, say that. Don't ever join an organization where they won't listen to you if you have a complaint. Mm -hmm. You know, don't follow the leadership you don't know where they come from or who's paying them. You know. And if you don't really, if you if you got a bad feeling and a bad vibe, either say something or leave. Like you're not, don't you know, follow uh, anybody blindly, you know, or follow somebody because they make a lot of noise, or follow somebody because they want to say something that sounds like they committed a felony in the open. Like why don't we go out there and shoot the police? No, brother, that's like that, you. Did, that's a conspiracy thing. So I am not following you nowhere to shoot no police. You got to get it on the tape. Like no, that those are just like the tools. Right, they either stupid or they provocateurs. In both cases, they get you in trouble. So you keep your head. You know, the advantage that we have, what, what you have, what people can't take away is your brain. Like, we don't have an Air Force, and we don't have a lot of money, but if you can think your way through this thing, you can make progress. You know, but don't sacrifice your brain because you feel something about something. Think about it. Feel it and think about it. You know, and then make a judgment and act on the judgment. You know, and don't get so excited that you just go do something stupid. You know, uh, and then you can survive. You know, like uh, like like the thing that worries me about Black Lives Matter is you have a nonviolent demonstration and somebody throws a brick. Well, why are you at a nonviolent demonstration if you want to throw a brick? You know, when I was with Dr. King, I didn't throw a brick because King said this is nonviolent, so I'm in his world. I'm going to follow his rules in that world. If I want to throw a brick, I'll own another brick for one demonstration. <laughs> but I would, not, I would not violate his organizational principles if I'm participating in something he organized. So I don't understand people that we're going to be not violent and somebody next to you throws a brick. That's either the police or they're stupid. Leave the case, get away from them. Because okay? you're going to get a shot. You in the front line, they throw a brick to the third ball. You're going to get a shot. You know, so, you know, keep, keep your brains about you. I mean, that's how, that's how you survive in an organization. That's how you move forward. You know, you think, you know, thinking is really important. Yeah, I just want to, you know, just, um, <clears throat> the important thing is not becoming dogmatic. You know. And if you kill anything, 
kill your ego. Mm. All right. The worst thing that will destroy any social movement and give the enemy uh, <clears throat> is counterintelligence calling to approach. Success is ego. All right. And so, in this society, built. Mm -hmm. All right. So you, you, we have to transform ourselves in order to transform society. Mm -hmm. So it means we have to be self. Less. All right. And John and I didn't come from need. All right. Person. All right. We committed class source. Yes. We committed our lives to the liberation of humanity, regardless. Some things we can say and some things we can't say. Yeah. And I was captured. Mm -hmm. And they told me, you're a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. And you know, they said we control this. Yeah. It was natural. And so, you know, we need to understand that we're in a war of liberation. A war of liberation of humanity because this is the largest empire that's ever been created on the planet. It has every nation in contradiction with itself. Every group in contradiction. Alienation uh, further than any uh, aspect that's ever happened on the planet Earth. So it means that we have to be very conscious Very spiritual, I mean, you know, and very scientific mm. right. in our inner relations with one another. Because if you see one another as the enemy, mm -hmm. you're not going to win. That's too, that's too. All right. So you have to control that negative ego mm. to correct that separate. Well, the, she's not in my group. He's not in my group, right? Right. right. Because it is that person that may save your ass. And this is uh, to the global community as well. Uh, these events are free and open to the public, uh, but there's a cost to travel our scholars in, to pay honorariums. And part of the reason it's free, I'm asking you to, uh, to support uh, the efforts of John Williams. Uh, so I'd like, if you can, to give contributions. Uh, if you can't do it today, uh, feel free to send it to my